Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Adult Chair Podcast, where we talk all about how to be emotionally healthy adults. That's what living in your adult chair is all about. So welcome. I am Michelle Shelfont. Delighted to be here with you today talking about happiness. Yeah. Monique Rhodes and I had a wonderful conversation about how you anybody can become happier in their lives. She is what they call a happiness strategist. How about that? We had a phenomenal conversation. We talked all about practical tools to increase your happiness, what you can start doing right now. You know how I love that. Let's do something right now and let's simplify it. That's what we do in the adult chairs. Everything is simple. She is the same way. I loved this girl. By, by the way, she was phenomenal. She talks to us about some very practical tools that you can use starting now that you can start changing, that, that will start changing your brain, your mind, and you too can become a happier person. I even asked her about someone that might be depressed or living with anxiety. She herself was depressed to the point of suicide and was ho hospitalized over this. So let me just tell you, she's got a lot of experience around this and she has completely transformed her life. And she does not say that lightly. She's very serious about her work and she says anybody can change their life brain and become a happier person. So I cannot wait for you guys to hear this show. Just wanted to remind you, we're talking about emotional regulation this whole month in the membership. So if you're somebody that would like to learn how to regulate their emotions, head on over to theadultchair.com forward slash membership. You've missed nothing. Everything is, is already recorded. It's in the back end, but there's still some live things that are happening the rest of the month and you can join us. I also wanted to remind you guys, if you're looking for support, do not forget to jump into the Adult Chair Closed Facebook group. It is a wonderful place to ask questions, to get feedback and support in and around your life. It's a closed group, so not everybody gets admitted into the group. We only want serious people that really know and understand and want more information on the adult chair. So if you're looking for that and people that actually speak our adult chair language, head over to the adult chair closed Facebook group. We would love to have you in there. Okay, let's talk about Monique Rhodes. Monique is a happiness strategist who teaches students and corporations around the world how to master their lives. She has spent the last 25 years studying the mind and its relationship to happiness and suffering. Over 70 universities and colleges use her program, The 10-Minute Mind, and her eight-week online course, The Happiness Baseline, has a 100% success rate in raising the mental wellness for every student who has completed it. That's pretty incredible, just saying. Monique hosts the daily In Your Right Mind podcast, where she discusses how a series of small habits determine our well-being. In 2010, Monique received a nomination for the prestigious New Zealander of the Year Award. It was just a pleasure to talk to her. Let me just tell you. Here we go with the wonderful Monique Rhodes. So welcome to the Adult Chair podcast, Monique Rhodes. So nice to be here, Michelle. Thank you for having me. This is going to be such a great conversation. I'm so excited. <laughs> I hope First, I can deliver. You are going to. I mean, I, you and I were just chatting. I was like, oh yeah, we've got a lot in common here. And um, I love your story. And I love to start the show with hearing a little bit about you and your story, because you're joining us today. Let me just remind the audience as a happiness strategist. That's pretty freaking awesome. <laughs> I just want to say, I know like, how lucky am I to be? That's what my life ended up. That's what I wake up every morning and teach. I, I feel that there's little to complain about when that's what you're doing. For well, your, I hope not. Yeah. If you're teaching how to be happy, I'm, I'm guessing you're the happiest person around then, right? <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty annoyingly happy. A lot of the time I've got to be honest. But I love that at one time you weren't. Yes. And at one time you actually talked about taking your own life. So you have been on the other side of the spectrum, which is what, this is why I want to hear your story. I would love for you to share anything you'd like to share as far as where you once were and then how you became a happiness strategist. Yeah, great. So 
I mean, life wasn't easy. Well, I was adopted at 10 days old into a family where, mm. yeah, there was a lot of difficulties. And I feel that by the time I was a teenager, I was well and truly depressed. You can usually tell when a 12 year old is listening to Leonard Cohen that they're probably struggling a little bit. Mm. And although, you know, at the same time, you know, I was popular at school and I did well at school, but I, I always felt like my emotions were a little bit like they were on a roller coaster, you know, up and down. And I never knew from moment to moment what the day was going to look like. And I found that really destabilizing. You know, we have this wonderful band from New Zealand, Crowded House, and they have that wonderful yes. song, uh, Four Seasons in One Day. I feel, feel like I would have about 20 emotional seasons in one day. Oh, wow. So it was very, you know, I was quite discombobulated and that was tricky. And by the time I, I left uh, home, I left home at 17, by the age of 19, I was really struggling. And a number of things happened. A close friend of mine died. I met my birth mother and I just was not, really wasn't coping. So I had a, a, a big low, a big low where I ended up in hospital having tried to take my own life. And while I was there, I kind of asked myself the question of, like, why was it that some people seem to be okay? Why was it that some people seem to kind of cruise through life and other people like me were just struggling so much? So I decided that it was a question that was worth trying to discover an answer. Maybe I was going to find that there was just something genetic in my makeup and, you know, in the way that I was in the world, or Maybe I was going to find that this happiness level that I was living with was movable if I could find a particular strategy to try and shift it. So I basically went on a mission and, you know, I still continue, of course, to study it. It's never ending. But, um, you know, that took me all over the world to all parts of Asia. Um, yeah, just everywhere, like experiencing you know, the most extraordinary places to live and the hardest places to live and the different philosophies to see if I could literally find a way to transform my own life. And obviously uh, I've been successful because one, I'm still here and mm -hmm. two, it's what I teach. So um, yeah, I, I literally transformed my own life to the point where I often say, you know, if I wasn't me, I would be jealous of myself. I didn't know that the level of happiness and joy and just the way that I experienced life was even possible. I sort of was hoping to get myself back to a place where I felt relatively normal in comparison to other people, but it's been way more than that. And um, sometimes I feel like I'm, you know, the kid standing on the podium, getting the gold medal for this, literally this Mount Everest that I've climbed and and now I get the, the wonderful joy of helping other people do the same thing. Mm. Okay. We need you to break it down for us. <laughs> of course you do. Of course you do. Okay. I'm like, okay, we're going to transform our life today on this show. We're going to make this the most listened to show ever. Uh, so <laughs> when I have a question, so how long people are going to ask this question, how long did it take you to go from suicide in the hospital to, and I'm sure it wasn't, you know, you went from one end of the spectrum all the way to the other, because you had quite a journey in between. Um, when did you start noticing like, okay, wait a minute, maybe I don't have to live like, maybe I don't have to suffer so much. Maybe I don't have to be so sad. Mm. And I'm going to uh, kind of take that, the answer that I give you and say, only because I had to figure it out myself, mm -hmm. I would probably say it took me 20 years to do it mm. uh, until I got to a place where I felt like, yeah, I'm really, I'm really feeling solid now. So it, and that journey was very difficult because it's not what we're taught. You know, what we're taught is money, wealth, uh, fame, uh, power, all, all these are all the things that are going to make you happy and grounded and solid in the world and safe in the world. And they're not. So I had to wade through a lot of, you know, misconceptions that culturally I'd grown up with. Mm 
So when I say it took me that long, the, the wonderful thing is, is that what I'm seeing now is that that transformation doesn't need to take anywhere near that long amount of time. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it was, it was, it was very slow, progressive. Like I'm a real experimenter. Try this doesn't work. Okay. Try this, try this, try this until I could find for me personally, what, what the answers were to shift it. So awesome. I did all the leg work. Okay. Good. Well, thank you for doing that. So we don't have to wait <laughs> 20 years. <laughs> we don't want to wait that long. You we don't. want the magic pill. We want to do it overnight, of course. Um, so talk to us about some practical tools to increase our happiness. What can we do if we're listening and we're wondering like, wow, you know, I, or I do a lot of suffering. What, what can I start doing like today? Yeah. I, I love that you use this word, the magic pill. I think the magic pill, Michelle, is a realization. I think that's the first place that we start. You know, I, I like to discuss it like this. You know, we wake up in the morning. I wake up in the morning. The first thing I do is brush my teeth. I take a shower. You know, I love to have my workspace really clean and tidy. I love my home to be clean and tidy. I put on clean clothes in the morning. I can tell from everything I'm seeing here, you are just the same, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the reasons that we do that is we feel better when we brush our teeth, take a shower, put on clean clothes and have a beautiful space to work from. We feel better. But the reality is this, is that, you know, we don't live in our house. We don't live in our office. We don't live in our clothes. Actually, where we live is in our mind. And Ooh, when was good. the last time that we cleaned out our mind? Mm, we don't, big. you know, instead, what we do is we almost have an open door policy on our mind. Okay. So it's like, it's like we have, let's say that our mind was, was this um, big room, right? It's like we've got all the doors and the windows open on this room and we allow everything in. We allow everything in. We allow all the wonderful things. We allow all the crazy stuff. And our room of our mind is just filled with so much stuff, so much shit, really, to yeah. be honest. Yeah, and we true. don't we don't ever think to clean it out. We just think, no, I can just keep piling all the stuff in here. Everyone else is doing it. Mm -hmm. It'll be fine, right? And yeah. so I think that's the biggest realization is that we believe that happiness and suffering comes from our external circumstances, but it doesn't. It comes from that mind that we just do not take care of. Mm, so true. And as you're talking, I'm very visual. So I'm visualizing. It's it, you're right you know, we let everything in and I'm thinking about that very clean room. And I do, I like my space tidy where I have to sit all day. Um, I might have some piles, but there are nice, neat little piles, like nothing's all over the place. And, um, but no, it's like someone coming in, dumping trash in the corners. Like, I wouldn't like that. Okay. All right. I'm with you. So we've got I mean, the you mind. Think about getting... all the, you think about all the stuff we put in. Okay. Yeah. Everywhere that we look, there is messaging coming into our minds, messaging of yep. violence, of wars, of, you know, political situations that are completely out of our control. Yes. We sit down at night to watch TV. It's full of violence and sex. And we're literally being brainwashed in, a, in an extremely out of control and stressful world. So and we true. wonder why we're suffering from stress and anxiety. And then of course, online, you know, these notifications constantly coming at us, you know, emails that are updating. We, we have normalized this. There's nothing normal about it. It's no. not sustainable. It's why, it's why we're suffering from a mental health pandemic that is probably way bigger than the COVID crisis we're facing right now. I think you're right. It's a very polarized world that we're living in. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I could go, I'm going to go, I'm not going to go off on that tangent anyway. So let's talk about it. So what are some practical tools that, that you can give us? So, you know, I'm just thinking about people that go, I don't think this would ever work for me. Like, I don't think so. You know, I'm sad. I'm depressed. And that was another question, like, give us some tools, but does this work for everybody? Like, does this work for Absolutely. someone that might be depressed or anxious or stuck in grief? You know, all of these things. Okay. 
All right. Yeah, so, absolutely. Because because the mind is an ordering principle. So the mind decides whether we're suffering or whether we, we're happy. So mm-hmm. if we can if we can start to shift our relationship with our mind, we start to see that all sorts of things begin to shift. All right. If we start to, because what we see is this, is that we have emotional reactions that are triggered usually by things that happened in the past. Yeah. And when we have these emotional reactions, we're reacting rather than responding. So yes. we need yeah. to slow or all, all that it is, is habit. We have to slow the habitual state of our mind so that we can actually start responding rather than reacting. But we're mm-hmm. in reactive mode all the time. So we have to see, okay, where are those habits stored? Where are those reactions stored? They're stored in our mind. So by getting to know our mind, getting to shift and change our relationship with our mind, then if we can make that the primary focus, all of a sudden, all of our external world begins to shift and change with that as well. Mm. But we struggle, you know, we're struggling to stay present. Oh, we struggle. We completely struggle to stay present. We struggle to stay here in this moment. And that's where all the stress and anxiety comes from. So how do we do it? Well, yeah. the first thing I'm going to say is, you know, if you can, a meditation practice every day is a game changer. I mean, it just is. Okay. It's, it's very practical. What you're doing is you're learning how to bring your mind back into the present moment. Mm-hmm. That's what meditation does. Yes. So you're basically sitting there, your mind dances off, you bring it back. Your mind dances off, you bring it back. That's all meditation is if you're taught it correctly. Yes. So a good thing to understand is that our minds are constantly dancing in between thoughts of the past and thoughts of the future. All right. We're, we're consistently going through our life, problem solving, solving things. So our mind dances to thoughts of the past to try and find solutions to solve it. But what we have to understand is the past is just a figment of our imagination because the past is just a very subjective memory Mm -hmm. based on what our mind filtered out. So the past isn't real and the future hasn't come yet. That's just also a figment Mm -hmm. of our imagination. If I was to say to you, what's going to happen on this day in one month, you will be completely wrong, almost without a doubt. Okay. So it's just an imagining. So the the past and the future are not reliable, but unfortunately, that's where our minds are going. So if we can learn how to be in the present moment, what happens is, is that it starts to ease out our mind because our mind just has to focus on being here rather than there and there, right? Mm -hmm. And if we can learn to be present in that way, our stress and anxiety immediately begins to dissolve. And that's one of the most powerful things that a meditation practice teaches us is it brings us back to the present moment. If you worry that, oh, I tried meditation before, my mind's too busy. Of course, your mind's busy. And when you start a meditation practice, the mind gets busier because what it does is it has a room to breathe that it doesn't usually have. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all the thoughts come in, but very quickly, they will start to settle down. So meditation helps you in that way. It also helps you get to know yourself, helps you get to see where does my mind habitually go? If someone upsets me or annoys me, where does my mind go? You know, if someone criticizes me, where does my mind go? So that you can slow yourself down instead Mm. of reacting, you start to bring yourself into a place where you begin to consciously respond. So that that's my first strategy is meditation is a game changer. I want to, I want to ask a couple of questions about that. So meditation, guided meditation, or just quieting yourself and following yeah. thoughts. Which Great one? question. Guided. All right. Okay. And I don't mean creative visualization. I mean, they're two different things. So creative visualization is taking you into a relaxed state. Mm-hmm. By guided meditation, it is not possible to sit and learn how to meditate without being taught. You have to be taught, okay? Mm-hmm. There, it's an art form. There's a skill to it. And it's hard as well as being incredibly simple. Yeah. So you need to find a qualified teacher that's really important. There's so many people out there at the moment who are like, 
I teach meditation who've been doing it for a few months or even, you know, maybe a year or so. You need to go and find someone who's really, really qualified to teach it because it's such a skill that has to be taught in a very specific way. So mm -hmm. yes, you, if you're quietening your mind, sitting there quietening your mind and you don't know what to do when the mind dances off, then you're not meditating. You're just probably ruminating. And frust getting frustrated and, and getting frustrated. Sure. So yeah. yeah, make sure you get so, taught. So guided meditation. Yes. How long should we look for an hour practice or a 10 minute practice? Like what do we yeah. need? So you need a practice that you'll do. Okay. <laughs> yeah. If you have all the time in the world and you're really inspired, do an hour practice, but will you do it every day? So with meditation, consistency is way more important than intensity. That's the truth. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the program that I have is a 10 minute program. It's called the 10 minute mind. And we trialed it at university college, London, which is one of the top universities in the world. My program's in about 70 universities now. Mm -hmm. And we trialed 10 minutes was 10 minutes enough. And we, we found through the studies we did on it. Absolutely. Wow. So I would rather that you did two minutes, three minutes, yeah. 10 minutes, then one hour, once a week or once a month. If you can do a practice that you feel excited about coming to rather than, you know, what we have a tendency to do is we have a tendency to get excited about something and then go big on it so that we, it's almost like we run out of juice. Yeah. I would rather you sure. got to the end of 10 minutes and be like, that wasn't long enough. And you want to come back tomorrow. So again, working with the habits of the mind. It's with, cons it's about consistency instead of the length of time that you're actually doing it, make sure Absolutely. you're doing it every single day. I, I share with, with, with people that listen to me that I do, or in the membership, actually, I do a three minute before I even get out of bed. I do the belly breath. I, I just lay there. I have insight timer. I set my three minute timer, three minutes, but I love to, to meditate. I actually also create a lot of meditations. And for my clients many years ago, I would say the same thing. You need to meditate. It's like going to the gym and lifting weights. You have to practice. It's a practice. You don't master it. It's a practice of bringing yourself back to the present moment. And so many clients said to me, I just don't have time. I'm not good at it. You know, I said, you're just, it's a guided meditation. I created a one minute meditation. So I don't Love want to hear it. any excuses from anybody that they don't have time. If you don't have time for a minute, then that's a problem. You should probably be doing 10 or an hour, really. So, um, yeah, but it's about consistency and doing it every day. So I love that commit to something that you're willing to commit to. And if you don't have 10 minutes out of a whole day, you really got to think about your life because we need 10 minutes for ourselves that self-care or self-compassion. So thank you. Yes. Okay. Meditation. Number two. I think that, uh, gratitude practices are really powerful. Yeah, because um, I think that we're living in a world full of doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, everything has a light and shadow. And we have a tendency as human beings to focus on the shadow side of things, rather than to be able to see actually what's working. Yeah. And yeah. when you when you look at a situation, you can see even the best situations have a shadow side to them. So I think it's vital to be able to understand that there's light and dark to everything and to to be able to see both. Yeah. And so to counter all of the negativity that we're facing, it's really important that we look at balancing that out with gratitude practices, without a doubt. I mean, gratitude practice can you know, you, there might be someone in your life that's just really upset you and annoyed you. And you can balance that annoyance immediately by thinking, and what is something that I'm grateful to them about? And suddenly mm -hmm. all of that energy and emotion can, mm -hmm. can, you know, just be dispelled quite quickly when you remember mm. who they are. We need to remember who other people are and all their goodness. And we need to remember who we are and our goodness as well. I love that. Yeah. Grat I mean, there have been so many studies done on a gratitude practice. It really yeah. does. Re it rewires the brain in, you know, in, as does meditation, obviously. Why do you think there's, there is so much suffering on the planet? I mean, it's not just in one country. It's, it's all over. We suffer. We're human beings suffer. 
What is your reason for that? What do you think? Yeah, I think that um, suffering is, you know, if you look at the Eastern philosophies, then you're looking at, you know, suffering is one of the fundamental things that we are dealing with. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that a lot of the suffering is self-imposed. And I think that this misunderstanding that we can't take charge of ourselves and our lives is almost one of the most painful lies that we've been told since we were children. So Mm -hmm. I think that that's often why we suffer. And I know for myself, one of the biggest things that I looked at, Michelle, was like self-responsibility is to, instead of uh, abdicating responsibility, blaming other people, it's your fault that this has happened, to really look deeply at myself and go, okay, well, this person did this, but what was my piece in it? What was my part in it? Mm -hmm. So I think if we're able to go into the world in all situations and ask ourselves those questions of, you know, how can I learn from this? How can I make sure this doesn't happen again? And how can I shift me? Then again, we start to see our life shifting. So I think that victim mode is a big, a big, big problem that we've got right now. I think think we've also got a problem with technology. I think that, you know, we have an immature relationship with it. I think that technology is, um, you know, overwhelming and its ability to suck us in and away from ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the more that we're disconnected from ourselves, the more we're disconnected from other people, the lonelier we are. And it's almost like we're then sucked back into this technology as the answer, but it's actually what's creating a whole heap of of distress and um, pain from a really, really young age as well. Well, you think about technology, I mean, it's, as, as far as so, social media goes, I mean, immediately our ego, the brain goes into like comparison mode. You know, you look at someone, I'm too thin, I'm too fat, I'm too this, I'm too that. You know, we compare and we put ourselves down so quickly. It's a hard place to live with, with technology, I think right now. It's just, it's a difficult, that's just one aspect of tech, but I yeah. agree. I agree. There's a lot of suffering. Do you think that people are hardwired for happiness or not? Like as a baby, if you take two babies, like why is it? And again, or is it our upbringing? Is it how we're wired? What is your thought on that? Mm, That's a great question. I think that there's a mixture. I think that there is, I think we come into the world, you know, with personality traits that can be make life easier or make like mm-hmm. life difficult that's the reality mm-hmm. but i also think you know it's the nature versus nurture question there's a lot of external circumstances depending on where we grew up the environment we grew up in and how that matches our particular personality traits that will determine a lot about how we manage to get through life and get through in the world so i think you know it's it's really vital for us to put ourselves in other people's shoes so that we can start to see maybe, maybe I was lucky growing up, you know, in this particular environment, maybe life is easier with this particular skin color, you know, so, or or this particular sexuality or whatever it is that our obstacles end up being, but everybody suffers even, you know, even the people who are the most successful and have all of the, you know, most incredible things in the world are very often the people that appear to be suffering deeply and grateful, greatly. So yeah, yeah, I think it's, I think it's the human condition and it's really a case of, I mean, I think being happy is, is, is our birthright. I think, I just think we live in a world that teaches us the exact opposite. And that's what always makes me sad is that it took me 20 years to figure this out. When I look back, I think, why was I not taught these skills at school? Exactly. Oh my gosh. That's another tangent I could go off on. Like that's, these are the things we need to learn about these kinds of things in school. We need to learn about our emotions, what to do with our emotions, happiness, Um, I've, I've talked about this on one of my shows a while ago, but, um, my sons, when they were living at home with me and they were in high school, their friends came came over. And, um, I remember one of them started talking to me about this really mean voice he had inside of his head. He knew I was a therapist. So we talked about it. I said, that's your inner critic. We all have one. 
his eyes got so big and he said, everybody has this voice. And I said, Mm. yeah, he could not believe it. So because Mm. he thought he was the only one, he was beating up on himself more. He thought there was something really wrong with him. Then my son overheard and he goes, wait a minute, everybody has that voice. And I said, yeah, by the time the evening or within like a minute or two, like all the boys in the room started talking to me. I was talking to this one kid and they all started talking. They said, wait a minute, wait a minute. They all then said, we all have that voice. We thought it was just us. You know, I thought it was just me. I didn't know. How empowering would it be for schools to actually talk about this? I'm with you. All you the know, way. I, I hear these kids in high school committing suicide and it makes me, oh my God, it just, it hurts my heart. It makes me cry. It's unnecessary. And so much, again, that's not, I'm not going to try to not go off on tangents, but if we only had this kind of thing in schools, meditation, gratitude, practice, emotional care. How do you feel your emotions? What about, um, let's talk about the inner critic and all of our inner parts, our perfectionistic part, our people pleasing part. We need this, but okay. Back to us. (laughs) I love it. I love what you're doing. Yeah. The adult chair, we're going to do this and I'm going to put the adult chair coaches in every school so they can start teaching this. So anyway, that's another story. All right. Any other tools that you can give us any other practical tools? Because I love this because people can can start this right now today, today. And by the way, I like to really break things down, like really simplify it for people, but gratitude, you gave us an, an example Gratitude does not have to be an hour long practice either. Like an hour long meditation. Gratitude can be, give us some examples like waking up and looking out at the sun or the rain and just being grateful for that. But any other tips on yeah, gratitude? There, there's a really big tip. I think that often we're taught, you know, to say I'm grateful for this or that. Sometimes people will say to me, I don't know what to be grateful for. I can look in any moment at anything, Say, right? I'm looking in front yes. of me. I'm grateful. There's, there's a candle in front of me. I'm so grateful for that because it's lit. All right. So this is where it's important. Most people are taught gratitude is just, I'm grateful, right? But there's a key to this. You must always say because. So if I say, uh, for example, I'm really, oh, here's a glass of water in front of me. I'm so grateful for this water. I'm so grateful for this water because it's quenching my thirst because Mm -hmm. there's so many places in the world where I wouldn't have access to clean water that can come straight out of a tap. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for it because it fills me with life and makes my body feel stronger and better. Mm -hmm. So to add the because on taps us into the feeling and that is where gratitude becomes a superpower. Okay. So I, I shy away from, I'm grateful for this. I'm grateful for that. I'm all about the, because is where the real juice is with it. And so that then starts to shift our mindset Mm -hmm. immediately because we start to see why is it that I'm grateful that the sun's shining because it was freezing cold yesterday. And I feel so much better when the sun's shining, you know? So we start to make that correlation between why these things are such a gift and how we are being gifted in our daily life constantly, endlessly in every moment. I can be grateful for the fact that I have sight. I'm grateful for the fact that my heart's still beating today. I'm grateful that there's trees outside my window right now because I'm in one of the most beautiful parts of New Zealand. I'm grateful that I can see a car parked out there. And I'm grateful that I have access to a car because I've lived in parts of India where they're walking, they're using horse and cart, you mm-hmm. know? So that's where we start to, to see that we're blessed. And we're when we start blessed. to shift mm-hmm. again, yeah, then, yeah. then we see, well, there's wars going on and there's pandemics and all this stuff. And I'm really blessed. I so we that. start to get that balance. I suggest to people, if I may add on to yours, to drop what I call dropping below the chin and feel what you're grateful for, which I think that's the same thing as going, saying yes. because, because et cetera, yeah. but drop below the chin. And I'm looking at, I'm like looking at my plant, right? Like, I love that plant right there. <laughs> I love plants. Like I'm a huge plant and I've got these two giant crystals. Like I love, I love all of the things in my office, but it doesn't have to be these big giant things. It can, like you said, 
I'm so grateful that I have my sight. Even on a rainy day, I'm like, ooh, the sound of the rain. And I'll sit and I'll feel it in my body. It's my, those are my favorite days to do a lot. Of, I, do, I do a ton of writing. So I'll sit and listen to the rain. I'm like, oh my God, thank you for this rain. I love the rain. And I, I have a lake in my backyard. So I hear it on the lake. I'm like, ooh, it's my favorite. But yeah, you can find great gratitude in anything. You just have to look and it doesn't, you can sit where you are now and look around the room and find something. So thank you for that. It's simple not big. It does not have to, you can do the big stuff too, but thank you. Um, is there a number three practical tool? Uh, oh, listen, one of the biggest practical tools that I see is whenever someone is suffering from depression, the first question I ask is around their social connections. And mm. almost always I am discovering that there's a breakdown in social connections. Yes. So it's really important to be aware of that balance between I need time alone, mm -hmm. but I also need time with people. And I had a really interesting situation because when COVID hit, I was in Los Angeles. So for nine months, you know, I was in full on lockdown. And then I came back to New Zealand because I was able to, and there was no COVID here. You know, we had mm -hmm. where I'm living, I had two COVID free year, 18 months of no COVID which wow. is, I know, incredible and hard to even imagine. But what it enabled me to do was to understand that even though I'm an extrovert, I, I need a lot of alone time. So it helped me to see, okay, uh, I need to have a, a social interaction, you know, with a, a proper social interaction and not just a casual one once every two days. Mm. And I would have thought I needed a lot more. And there'll be a lot of people that think they need a lot less, but to actually be able to quantify it now and go having spent all that time alone and then coming back into the real world where I didn't have the tolerance, you know, for seeing people, I would become completely exhausted after a, a small amount of time. As I know lots of people have been experiencing, yeah. but to actually recognize that after a two days, it wasn't so healthy for me. So it's really important that we don't get ourselves caught in these bubbles now of safety where we have kind of narrowed our social sphere down just because of the implications of what we've been through with COVID. It's really important that we understand as human beings, we're social, we need to be in relationship with others and to really look who are the people in my life? I might not feel like contacting people, but it's really important for my mental wellness that I do. That is such a good point because after COVID, I found myself too, like, oh, wait, I've got to connect with people. Like it was yes. like, because I love my alone time, but I did miss, I'm like right in the middle. Sometimes I feel like I'm more of an introvert, but I do love, I love to connect with people too. I don't know, I'm, I'm in the middle, but it was difficult. And a lot of people did share that very difficult. Now, like it felt awkward is what people say. It's kind of awkward now to get with people, the brain, our brains must have rewired just to be alone. So now how do you get with other people? But I'm thinking about someone that's depressed. I was depressed and I don't want to see anybody. I know what that was like in my twenties. Uh, that's hard to connect with people when you feel depressed, you don't want to connect. So what do you say to that? Like, how do you even begin that like because again first we have the thought process that's not happy it's the opposite of happy i'm not meditating i'm not in gratitude right now in fact my life stinks and i'm depressed what do you say to that person to help them to take that next step yeah i think that the first thing is just to be honest with people yeah. and say listen i'm struggling a little bit at the moment or a and lot to have uh, social interactions that are not so much based around the head but more based around the physical. Mm -hmm. Hey, listen, I just really love it. If we went for a walk together, you know, or let's go for a bike ride or something where you're not going down the rabbit hole of what's happening in your mind and to literally give your mind a break. Yeah. So to find people also that you feel safe with people that it's important to understand that when you're depressed, you can't hand that over to somebody else, but if you are just able to be with them within it, no one can fix it for you. You're going to have to fix it for yourself. But what if you started going walking regularly with someone in your life? 
Oh, the exercise, the food, the sleep, all of the things that we have to look at, really, 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 really important. Okay. And suddenly we're out exercising because someone's helped us have the motivation to do it. Mm -hmm. So all we do is we experiment. Okay. If I go for a walk with this person, how do I feel? I actually feel a little better. Was it about that particular person or was it about the exercise or was it a mixture? Mm -hmm. And to actually use yourself as as a science experiment, if I eat sugar, how do I feel half an hour after I've eaten? It? If I get seven hours of sleep, how do I feel when I wake up in the morning? If I get on social media, how am I feeling half an hour after I've been on it? If I'm watching a, a violent TV show, how am I feeling? If I was to take you, Michelle, and put you into a, I'm trying to think of a place and you know, like I'm thinking of those places in the UK that it's raining and it's dreary and it's like, you know, like I take you into this house and it's cold and it's dark and it's miserable. What's going to happen to you? You're going to become depressed. Yeah. And I'm not saying that depression is this simple, but I'm also saying we have to be unbelievably aware of yeah. the environments that we're putting our, our mind again into. Am I exercising? so that my mind's better? Am I eating food? You know, I've learned over the years that there are specific foods that actually have a direct correlation with a difficult mood for me. Mm -hmm. So I have to eliminate those foods from my diet because I've seen that I can be totally fine. I can eat a particular thing and I can watch my mood just dissolve and can take me hours to pull it back. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm with yeah. people, you know, who are the people that I'm spending time with? Are they loving people? Are they people who are critical of me? Are they my parents who have been a, a cause of a whole lot of problems? So to look at all these elements and see, actually, maybe a whole bunch of the answers are sitting in the environment that I'm creating for myself. I love that. And, and I just wrote down, that would be our number four, like really to increase your awareness of self because people are watching the television shows watching the news, getting on social media, and they're not connecting how bad they feel when they're doing it or when they get off of social media or whatever. And I love what you said about food. I know when I eat sugar, I crash 30 minutes later. I just know it. I anticipate it now. I know it's coming. So I have to be very mindful. Like if I'm going to get on and do like a live teaching, I am not going to be having a cookie or I'm not going to have anything with sugar but it's really aware and it's knowing yourself so well that you then can navigate through life as a happier person, because you're aware mm. of the choices that you're making. And, um, you know, the people that leave like TV on all day long, and they're not even aware of what's going on in the background, be aware of what's on the TV. It's affecting us. Don't take a nap with yucky TV on. Don't take a nap with the news on. All that is going to the subconscious mind. Don't watch the news. I know. Our minds are like sponges. You know, I, I'm off the news. We watch yeah, when we watch the news. Like, go online, read the headlines. Put that's a time. That's what up. I do. Yes, ten I was minutes, getting you know? so anxious watching. I was like, the between the music and the tone of voice of the people doing the news, I'm like, I am so anxious. I'm done. I don't do the news, but I do read the headlines. It's not like I don't know what's going on. And I'll yep. I'll say to my husband, tell me anything that I need to know that I might have missed, but I can't watch it. I'm too sensitive, and my nervous yeah. system gets too activated. But that's me knowing me. And, and I would invite other people to do the same because it affects your happiness. It's directly linked to our happiness and our emotional state. So that's, I like that. I'm going to make that our number four. <laughs> I love it. Do you have anything else you want to share? Oh, just to, you know, I just want to say not to take life too seriously. Yeah. You know, to have fun, to, delight in the small things it's not the big things that are going to make you happy it's the small things it's like playing with your dog or playing with the kids or taking a walk in nature or seeing a beautiful bird fly by or whatever it is those are the things like they are available to all of us no matter what our socioeconomic status is no matter how successful we are at yes. work or not successful all of it is right there and to to not believe that all the things you're told are going to make you happy will be the answer. It's so hard. You know, we're mm -hmm. delivered it like, like honey and we're the bees here it is, here it is. But yeah, just look at all of the, you know, well-known people who are 
either out of control or addicts or taking their own lives. Like it's all in front of us. It doesn't work. So we have to start looking within and be very, very, very conscious about what you put into your mind, you know, and just see. And then, then the choices become really simple because it's just like you, you think I want to do a really good podcast. I really want this cookie. I'm not going to have it now because I won't be able to do the good podcast. So you start to then get really clear on why you're doing things. And then we, I call it choose a plan. You know, it's like, it's not discipline. It's choose a plan. You don't do it because (laughs) there's someone going, don't eat the cookie. You do it because you choose it. It's a discipline that comes from choice because suddenly you go, well, if I want to be happy, then this is, this is going to work better for me. And you don't feel deprived. You just feel like, yeah, this is doing this it is what I want to do. Me. Yeah. Like yeah. I'm doing it for myself. Yes. <laughs> this is a good thing. I, I agree with you so much about, um, again, playing with a dog, doing these really simple things, but you've got to be in the moment. That's the key. It's being in the present moment, which is where you started with this. It's like, I can go sit on my back, I have a little platform, like a dock section that like sit out, sits, I look out over the, on the water and I'm like, good Lord, I'm so happy right now. And I, but I'm not enjoying that. If I'm thinking about the podcast I have to do in two hours or what I did yesterday, you've got to be in the moment and feeling the chair on the back, feeling the sun on my face, looking out over the water and going, wow, this feels so it's again, that feeling that sensing of what I'm doing. I can look at my dog and he's kissing me on the face and I'm in total bliss, but we miss these things, these opportunities to be in happiness when we're, like you said, in the future, in the past, future past. I I love this. This is so good. there's There's another thing there, Michelle, that's really important for us to understand is that we're also living in a world now where we have, it has been normalized to be interrupted. So let's say I'm sitting outside your home, looking at the lake, or I'm down here. I've got a lake down here. It's not in my backyard, but almost. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting there and there is my phone next to me. Oh, there's a text message. Oh, there's an email. Okay. So to have really, really clear guidelines for yourself about if I'm going to take time out, what does it look like? So I am really disciplined about this. Like when work finishes, it's over. I don't have email on my phone. Yep. The only notifications that come in are text messages. I have two phones, one for work. That's Ooh, completely okay. separate from my personal phone. And I have a very, very, very conscious relationship with my technology because I know that, you know, there's been studies done at MIT that show that if you are having a conversation with someone and you're in the same room together and there's a phone that's visible, even if it is face down and mm-hmm. on silent, it will uh, decrease the amount of intimacy in the conversation mm. because there, there is a subconscious knowing from both the people in that conversation that at any point they could get interrupted. So wow. we've normalized this. It's really important that we have, um, uh, we have control over what, what is interrupting me? You know, there's not, I I tell you, there's nothing worse than you're having a conversation with someone and their phone goes off and they answer it and they answer it because when you're the other person, yeah. Yeah. yeah, when you're the other person, the message that you get is this is more important than you. And when we're told over and over again, this is more important than you, we start to believe it and we start to become insecure and we start to become fearful and we start to not be able to hear each other. But one yeah. of the most beautiful things we can give someone is just that uninterrupted time to actually hear them. And I think that's super powerful. I love that. It sends a message, I think, too, that I just don't, that you don't matter. Like if I'm sitting yes. here and, and we're having lunch and I've got my phone and my phone's going off, I'm the whole time it's saying, you don't matter, you don't matter. Yeah. I, I, I heard a study, I wish I could remember where it was from. I don't remember, it was years ago that when our, when our text message goes off, it sends us into fight or flight. Even if it's a lovely text, even if it says, hi, it's mom, I love you. You know, it's like, when we hear that ding on the phone, our whole nervous system jolts and we go into fight or flight. Like, why is that? Like, take a break from the phone. Like we need a break. And there needs to be designated times throughout the day that we do have our phone with us and we check it. Otherwise I'm with you. 
put it away, silenced off, whatever it needs to be. Oh my gosh, this was so good. Anything else that you want to share about happiness? Anything at all? Oh, I mean, there's endless things I could share. Not off the top of my head. I think that if, you know, if really it comes back again, Michelle, to that realization, that understanding that it's coming from the mind. If we can understand that and really focus on working with our mind as the primary focus, then everything begins to change. And to understand that we don't have to have other people change. We, if we can shift, mm -hmm. then everything shifts. And that's what I see with my students is that as we get them shifting their whole life shift, you know, they go home for Christmas and stuff and they come back and they go, Oh my God, it was so weird. Like my whole family had a really different conversation this year. And the only thing that's changed is them. So yeah. we don't need to change anybody else. Mm -mm. We just need to work with ourselves. It's not what your kid's doing or your husband or your wife or whatever. It's like, how am I showing up in the world? And if I can shift how I am, then my whole world can actually change. So mm. the transformation is right there. That is awesome. I love that. It's so true. We have to change if we want our relationships to change. No doubt about it. Ah, oh, this was awesome. Where would people find you in all the yeah, beautiful sure. things that you're offering? Yeah, just come to Monique Rhodes, M-O-N-I-Q-U-E-R-H-O-D-E-S.com. Everything's there. I podcast. I have some amazing courses or just drop me a line. Like I'm just really happy to help in any way that I can. I love it. Thank you. We'll, we will put that in the show notes for sure. And thank you so much for being on today and sharing all of your, your wisdom with us. We sure Such my it. pleasure. Thank you for having me, Michelle. I really appreciate it. All right, you guys hope you enjoyed that show. And I hope starting today, you will complete some of these practices start today doing, even if it's a one minute meditation, that is, don't forget on my website, theadultchair.com or on my YouTube channel, do the one minute meditation. It doesn't mean you've got to do an hour, just a minute, right? Start today and do these little, what I call these micro moments of gratitude. I love doing those. It just takes a second or a moment to sit and have gratitude about things and feel it, drop it below that chin. So important. What else do I want to say to you? If there's ever a show that you guys want to hear and you're not sure if I've done it, don't forget that on the adultchair.com website, if you go to my podcast page, there's a search bar. You can search for just about anything. I've probably done a show on it. We're at show 310 today. <laughs> I've done a lot of shows. So many people email in and they ask if there's a show on this or that start out with a search bar on that adult chair page on the podcast page. And I'm telling you, all those shows will pop up. You can have a field day in there, just putting in all kinds of keywords and all the shows will come up that you are looking for. All right. That's about all I've got for you today. I will see you next week seated right here in the adult chair. Have a wonderful and beautiful week, everybody. <laughs>